We are almost ready to cross over to Jeju Island for the ceremony and President Moon Jae-in's speech. In the meantime, let's get some more in-depth analysis on the Jeju April 3rd incident from an expert. We'll be keeping a close eye on the goings-on in Jeju as we uh, await the president coming onto the stage uh, to give us a speech. So joining us today is Professor Anjun uh, Song, visiting professor from JD Michigan uh, State University, currently at Yonsei University here yeah. in Seoul. Uh, thank you ever so much for coming in. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've been watching a couple of reports about this uh, incident, the April 3rd Jeju incident, but for many Koreans, it's an unfamiliar part of uh, the country's history. Can you give us a little bit more detail about what went on there? Yeah. Uh, the the Jeju April 3rd incident referred to April 3rd of year 1948. Mm -hmm. But before we talk about 1948, we have to know what happened in the year 1947. In March 1st, 1947, uh, there's about 40, over 40,000 Jeju Islanders got together to celebrate the March 1st movement, right? The Samilchal. Mm -hmm. And there was a, several police fire against civilians, and six uh, people died, and including one six year old boy. And that triggers the kind of the anti-American sentiment in the minds of Jeju Islanders. And about that time, the United Nations General Assembly passed Resolution 112 to conduct general election, the first general election in the in Korean Peninsula. But however, due to the uh, Russian objection, the, the election only conducted in South. Mm. But the afraid of that the, you know, the division by the United Nations, and the, the, there was a several hundred of South Korean Labour Party which was connected to the North Korean Communist Party, obviously. And they uh, raided, like, four, like April, um, April 3rd, 2 a.m., they raided about 12 police stations out of 24, uh, half of the police station in, station in, in Jeju. Mm. And at the same time, and they started, you know, that, that incident happens. Yeah, so that's uh, the background to what sparked uh, the massacre and the reaction from uh, the authorities uh, by South Korea and the U.S. as well. We are keeping an eye on uh, what's happening in Jeju. It doesn't look like they're ready to start yet, though. Uh, but, but for someone just hearing about the history, I suspect it's, it's really hard for them, especially our international viewers, to get their, their minds around exactly what happened. Um, do you think this April 3rd incident uh, really shaped uh, the attitudes of uh, Jeju Islanders even to this day? Yeah, I think that's really have a significant impact on the Jeju Islanders, you know, the mindset, also, also including the mainlanders also, because the, it, we haven't really talked about it publicly. Mm. Because I, the first time I heard about the you know, Jeju, you know, the April 3rd incident was the, I saw the you know, famous TV soap opera, which was in 1991. And they briefly talk about the, the incident. And so I was in college. I was, I was like, oh, there's something I didn't learn from my high school, and was even school. They never talk about it, yeah. history book. I was like, something new. I was surprised to see it. And I had some friend actually from Jeju Island, and they didn't really talk about much, but somehow they talk about something happened, they, about the distrust against you know, mainlanders and the, how they feel about it. And then you know, some, there's some social issues behind it. And um, the government has made efforts to uh, compensate the survivors and the, the bereaved families mm -hmm. as well. Uh, can you just tell us what they received and do you think it was sufficient uh, compensation? Yeah, it was uh, 1997 when the former president Kim Dae-jung was elected and, uh, you know, the Jeju, Jeju people, I mean, People, was Jeju, Jeju in, people in Jeju was very uh, happy about it because he was the first president who promised to uh, conduct official investigation about on the matter. And that's what he did. And he, uh, he passed the, you know, the special act on, uh, regarding the Jeju April 3rd incident. And what happened was that the special act do have, does have I mean, the provision related to the compensation. But there's some uh, problem there because the way it defined the victim in the special act, which include the uh, dead people who, who were dead, missing, or the first imprisoned during, uh, due to the incident. However, the compensation only allowed to the living victims, which is about 110 people. Right. Yeah, so very limited you know, compensation. Yeah, absolutely, because it happened so many decades right. ago. Uh, we're still watching video footage from uh, Jeju. We'll be crossing over there uh, later, it looks like a beautiful 
uh, spring day there. What's your take on this commemoration and what uh, especially is the significance of President Moon going today, the first sitting South Korean leader uh, to make the trip uh, down there to commemorate uh, this day, this anniversary? Yeah, I think it's a very historic uh, you know, movement because mm -hmm. that is the first president, actually, the sitting president who actually attended the, I mean, the, the meeting, right? So I think that's the one kind of beginning of the new, you know, new era because you try to see look at the dark side also, the history, not only bright side and dark side looking into it, something we never talk about, it, but that's what's there, right? The truth, right? So I think it's, it's a good starting point to, you know, teach next generation, you know, something we did wrong and try to teach them, you know, should not repeat the same mistake in the future. Yes, and this is what uh, President Moon is really pressing home, is about recognizing all of Korea's history, the, the good spots and also the dark spots, and uh, establishing that in the constitutional revision that right. uh, his administration is trying to put forward. Uh, what do you think, uh, do you think th this visit today is part of that effort? I, I think so. I mean, there's the, the, the Moon Jae-in administration tried to add the changes, right, to preamble to the Korean constitution mm -hmm. to include several provisions, I mean, several new sentences, which including that the Jeju April 3rd incident. I think that's a great move to, uh, you know, I mean, that's the one. We have to teach history about some, we can't tell, talk about just something, everything right, right? We mm. have to talk about something wrong, mistakes, mm. so we can, you know, to not repeat the same mistake. I think that's a really good point, I mean, to, start, to begin with. Absolutely, and uh, that is uh, very much the case. I want to just quickly stick with uh, President Moon because he was chief of staff hmm? uh, to No Mi Hyun, right. who was the first president to officially apologize right. for the actions of the, uh, uh, the authorities on Jeju Island. He did so in 2003. Uh, do you think another reason for President Moon going today is his uh, ongoing affection for his former boss? Yeah, I, I guess uh, I guess there's some part of it, but but I think the main the uh, reason he's going to Jeju today is not only about his affection to his uh, former boss, it's about his. I think he's also the civil rights activist, right? Mm -hmm. Lawyer, he's you know helping you know people in need, right? So he understands you know you know pain about the people who did not get attention, right? So I guess he's the right. I mean, he's the one who really understands it. You know, the sorrow. To, uh, yeah. Okay, the ceremony is ongoing. We were looking at the names of some of the victims of the April 3rd incident there. Um, so, we've touched on it many times now, but South Korean leaders before President Moon never attended this ceremony. Uh, do you think now that President Moon has, has gone and is going to give a speech, should this become an annual uh, event where every single South Korean president, regardless of their political affiliation, should go to? Yeah, well, I mean, personally, I think that should be that way, but, you know, you can't tell in the future right, what right. happens in the next, next president, what we do. But I think that's the very, I mean, I mean a good idea to doing it without the aff political affiliation. It's not about the politics, it's about the social issue, I think. Mm. And then there was, uh, I mean, people died, and without knowing why they were dying, and there's, you know, there's, you know, excessive, you know, government power and abuse the civilians, right, killed, must kill, right. So I think that's the things we have to pay attention. I think going, getting to the, uh, the, com the meeting, the annually by the president, I think that's a good sign for the reconciliation. Yeah, let's hope so. And uh, let's also hope that President Moon continues to go um, for the duration of, of his uh, term. Uh, during my research into our chat today. I, I, I did read that Jeju Islanders weren't allowed to publicly talk about the April 3rd incident all the way until 1997. You said you saw a, a drama back in 1991 that didn't go into too much detail <laughs> right, about right. what went on. It kind of scratched right. the surface. Uh, can you explain why the people of Jeju weren't allowed to speak up until then and what was it that changed in, in 1997? You have to look at what happened in 1997, actually. The, uh, the former president, the, the, you know, Kim Dae-jung, was elected. Mm. So he was one publicly promised to conduct investigation, government investigation on the matter. So there was happy, and they knew that 
the government will do something for them for the first time after decades, right? So they were happy and they were willing to talk about it. And then the former president, uh, Kim Dae-jung, kept his promise and he uh, formed the Special Investigative Committee and, and they, they do the, and passed the Special Act. I was speaking to uh, a friend of mine, a Korean friend of mine, whose family is from uh, Jeju, mm -hmm. and even despite the fact that some of her relatives uh, were actually went missing, mm -hmm. never to be seen again, or, or died, she didn't have that much of an understanding about the history. So it goes to show just how uh, purged from the history books right, right. this uh, awful event was. and. Uh, well, that's where we're going to uh, break into our conversation with Professor Anne because we are going to pass over to the ceremony uh, in Jeju. We'll be coming back to Professor Anne shortly. But in the meantime, let's uh, listen in to uh, President Moon Jae-in. Residents of Jeju Island. On each stone wall and every fallen blossom of camellia where the ages of grief is present here in Jeju Island, you all have asked, does spring exist on this land for the past seven decades? Today, I would like to let you know of the spring of Jeju. Despite the lengthy tragedy, deep sorrows that have led to tears, Spring will blossom here in Jeju, just like grape blossoms are in full bloom. You haven't forgotten the April 3rd incident, and there are those who were in pain with all of you. And thus we are able to gather like we are here today, overcoming the times of silence. The surviving victims, bereaved families and residents of Jeju Island have exerted their full efforts to let the bitter grief, pain and truth of the incident be known. And thus, I sincerely console all of you and extend my deepest appreciation. Citizens of Jeju and fellow Korean citizens, 70 years ago here in Jeju Island, innocent people lost their lives under the name of ideology. Although they didn't know what ideologies were, the innocent civilians who lived happily even without home gates, beggars and thieves were slaughtered without knowing why. On November 17th of 1948, the martial law was proclaimed on Jeju Island, and centering around the mountainous areas in the center, the operation of making the island desolate unfolded. If a single fa a person of the family was missing, all of them were killed just because they were labeled as the family of an evader. 90%, 95% of the villages were put on fire, and there were even villages where the entire people had been killed. From 1970, 1947 to 1954, an estimate of one-tenth of the Jeju's then population, or about 30,000 people, lost their lives. The boundary of life and death drew by the ideologies was not only present at the site of the massacre. People lost all of their family members all at once, but they continued to carry out their lives, staying silent in order not to be labeled as the family of writers. The agonies were passed down continuously. The parents had to wither their children's aspirations of wanting to work for the nation by becoming soldiers and civil servants. While the April 3rd incident is a pain and sorrow that have been left in all parts of Jeju, Jeju became an island that must erase all memories in order to survive. And for a long time that can, cannot be expressed in words, the truth was not erased from the hearts of the Jeju residents. Tearful efforts to correct April 3rd incident within our history did not stop. On April 27, 1960, at the Gwandokjong Plaza, students and youth of Jeju came together fighting against the unjust authorities that forced them to stay, stay still and forget. 
1,500 uh, 1500 middle and high school students of Jeju condemned the March 15 illegal election and cried out for the truth of the incident. And that year, the spring of April did not last long before it was withered by the May 16 military power, yet the courage of letting the truth be known did not disappear. Numerous April 3rd incident organizations recall the memories of the incident. And remembering the incident was a taboo, and just talking about it was considered rebellious. Yet amid such oblivion, there were those who awakened us by engraving the pain of April 3rd incident into pieces of art. During the peak of Yushin dictatorship in 1978, novelist Hyung gi Young published Sunni's Uncle, and there was Kim seok bums The Death of Kraw and Volcanic Island, poet Lee San Ha's epic poem of Hallasan Mountain, painter Kang yo bae who finished the April 3rd series of 50 works during three years, completed the withering of the camellia flower. And there was the first ever documentary movie featuring the April 3rd incident, director Cho Chang Bong's Red Hunt, Ji Si of director Oh Myeol, Jeju Prayer of Director Im Hung Sun, The Sad Song of Tarang Shigul Cave of Director Kim Dong Man, Late Director Kim Kyung Lu's Endless Song Times, and singer An Chi Hwan's Sleepless Namdo Island. At times, the efforts of these artists that have led to their arrest and imprisonment have helped us be aware that the April 3rd incident is not just an unfortunate incident of the past, but rather a story of all of us who live the present. And finally, we became to realize that remembering the truth about the incident is the process of opening a new road to democracy, peace, and human rights. And together with the residents of Jeju Island, there were many who remember the pains of the April 3rd incident, and thanks to them, we have been awakened. And to all of the agony and efforts arose that arose from state violence, I extend my deepest apologies and appreciation once again as the President of the nation. Surviving victims, bereaved families of the April 3rd incident, fellow citizens, the victory of democracy has finally opened the road to the truth. In 2000, the Kim Dae-juk administration enacted the Special Act on unveiling the truth of April 3rd incident and launched the April 3rd incident committee. President No Moo for the first time as nation's sitting president, acknowledged the nation's responsibility over the April 3rd incident and participated in the memorial service to apologize to the victims, the Biri families, and the residents of Jeju. Today, based on such principle, I vow that I will continue to head towards a complete solving of the incident. There will be no stepping back or a cease in regaining the impaired reputation and revealing the truth of the April 3rd incident. And on top of this, I declare that the truth of April 3rd incident is something that cannot be denied by any forces and that it has now been stationed as a clear historic fact. I will establish the truth of the violence pushed upon by the state authorities, stop the false accusation and regain the impaired reputation. To do this, I will continue to complete, complete the excavation of the remains. The government also on its part will exert its full efforts to heal the wounds and pains of the bereaved families and surviving victims. And on one hand, the government will closely cooperate with the National Assembly on areas that need legislative support, including compensation and an establishment of a National Trauma Recovery Center. 
A complete solving of the April 3rd incident is indeed a firm basis of reconciliation and unity, as well as peace and human rights longed for, longed for by the Jeju Island Islanders and all of our citizens. Citizens of Jeju, fellow Korean citizens, right now Jeju is overcoming all of the past agonies and reviving as a land of peace and life. Today, before the fallen spirits of the April 3rd incident, we once again affirm that peace and coexistence can only stand on truth instead of ideology. A fierce conflict of the left and right led to a tragic history, but the victims of the April 3rd incident and Jeju residents have moved beyond the distrust and hatred left behind by ideologies. Late Mr. Oh Chang-gi was wounded during the incident, but voluntarily served the Marine Corps when the Korean War broke out and participated in the Battle of Incheon. Late Mr. Kim Tae-seng, who lost his life, wife, parents, mother-in-law and sister-in-law, decided to serve in the military voluntarily after writing a letter of patriotism in blood. The youth who were named communists during the incident protected their home and even risking their lives. Ideologies were only used as a justification for genocide. The residents of Jeju defeated the tragedy caused by ideologies with reconciliation and forgiveness. And in Jeju's Hagiri, a commemorative statue was established for the fallen heroes who died protecting the homeland and victims of the incident. The statue was established with the aim of forgiving as all of them were victims. And in 2013, when the conflict peaked, the organization of the April 3rd bereaved families and the Jeju Veteran Police Association declare, declared reconciliation with no conditions. Now the movement of reconciliation reached out by Jeju Islanders must be enjoyed by all of our citizens. Standing here today, I would like to appeal to the citizens of the nation. Still today, there are many who turn their backs against the truth of the incident. There are still those who look at the April 3rd incident with distorted perspectives of past ideologies. And still in Korea, there are narratives of hatred and hostility left behind by ideologies. Now we must be able to face the painful history. Facing the tragic history is not only between nations, we ourselves now must confront the April 3rd incident and move beyond the framework of outdated ideologies. Now the Republic of Korea must be a nation where a just conservative and just liberal compete with justice. And we must usher in an era where fair conservatives and fair liberals are evaluated based on fairness without justice and fairness, whether it be conservatives or liberals, the flag of victory cannot be won for our citizens. The dark shadow of hostility that was present in all corners of our lives must now be removed and let us all make efforts to let dignity bloom. This is indeed what the hills of Jeju are telling us today. Surviving victims, bereaved families of the April 3rd incident and fellow Korean citizens, unveiling the truth of the April 3rd incident is about regaining the universal value of human rights and reflecting back on our tragic history moving beyond the boundaries of regions. Regaining the impaired reputation of the incident is our future of heading towards reconciliation and coexistence, as well as peace and human rights. Even amid deep wounds and scars, Jeju Island shouted for values of peace and human rights for the past seven decades. And such values will lead to peace and coexistence on the Korean Peninsula and further continue as a message of peace for the humanity. The desire for April 3rd incident for eternal peace and human rights will never sleep. This is also a historic responsibility given to me as president.
Today's commemorative ceremony should be a comfort for the fallen heroes and victims of the April 3rd incident, and I hope it can become a new starting point for us all. Okay, there we have it. That was President Moon Jae-in delivering his first speech on uh, the Jeju April 3rd incident, one of the darkest periods in Korea's history. Unfortunately, he did go rather uh, over schedule, so we don't have time to ask another question of our guest, Professor Andrew Song. Thank you ever so much for coming into the studio. We appreciate your insights today.